Alrighty. Hey, welcome. Chapter five. So first of all, what? Chapter five, what happened to chapter four? Um, chapter four is on development and development is one of the expertise of Kyle Danielson. He's the professor who teaches psych AO2. Uh, and so it makes more sense for us to have him talk about that in the context of psych AO2. Uh, and so it's not part of this course. So we have one, two, three, five, six, seven, eight, nine will be the ones that we will cover. Okay, so we're going to skip four, and here we are up to five. Um, I actually kind of like this organization anyway, because I think five flows a little bit nicer from three, um, where you got to know the, the lobes of the brain. So let's jump here. Despise chaos, create order. You know, we're going to sort of return to talking about the lobes of the brain uh, a little bit, and how they... Um, how they achieve this magical feat that we're going to call perception. Uh, but along the way, we're going to talk about sensation and perception, etc. So we're going to get into some of the details in subsequent lectures. This one is about giving you the big picture uh, of what the brain is up to. Uh, and hopefully to have you leave this lecture kind of impressed and amazed by how good your brain is at doing what it does. Okay, so let's jump in. Here we are, back to our back to our brain. Less ugly colors this time. Uh, I prefer this brain, I think. A <laughs> nice clean brain. And I've made this point to you before, but let me stress it again. We can kind of think of these three lobes, sort of the back half of the brain almost, um, as all kind of doing the same thing, but with different um, sub roles. And that thing is they're getting input from the world. Um, and that world may include in the parietal lobe, our bodies, for example, where our body parts are, but, you know, visual inf information about what's out there, auditory information about what's out there, and then spatial information, you know, where things are, where we are, etc. And, and so all of this is input. And that's what we're going to really talk about today is, is the amazing thing the brain does with input. Uh, and so I want to introduce this to you with this quote from a Dan Brown book. Uh, so first of all, professors sometimes like Dan Brown books. They, they like them because it's one, he's one of the only authors where the hero is a professor. So, hey, what's cool about that, right? Watching this action professor um, do all this kind of cool stuff. Um, it's also interesting from a professor's point of view because, of course, Dan is a, is a, is a creative writer um, and he's a good writer. And in the books, there's often situations where somebody is giving a lecture to a crowd of people. And it's always fascinating for a professor to kind of watch a writer describe a lecture and, and how it unfolds. And the writer, of course, has powers that the professor does not have because they can control the voice of the students as well as the voice of the instructor. Uh, and so they can create these fascinating sort of interactions. But it's still always interesting to kind of watch you know, how uh, a literary person would imagine a, a powerful lecture to work. And so this is one of those cases from the book. And in, in this specific instance, um, there's going to be a character speaking named Edmund. And, and essentially, this character is Elon Musk. <laughs> He's an Elon Musk kind of character, a so-called futurist, um, somebody with a lot of money who is always trying to push the envelope on technology and what's possible for the future. And he's just come up with this amazing discovery that he's going to tell a bunch of people about. But before he gets to his discovery, he wants them to understand their brain a little better. And so he's talking to them about their brain. And, and this is what he says. Um, I, th I think he really nails something here that, that's going to carry with us. So let me just read through this. Like an organic computer, your brain has an operating system, a set of rules that organizes and defines all of the chaotic input that flows in all day long. Language, a catchy tune, a siren, the taste of chocolate. As you can imagine, the flow of information is frenetically diverse and relentless, and your brain must make sense of it all. In fact, it is the very programming of your brain that defines your sense of reality. So let's just stop here for a moment here. What, 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 what's he saying here? When we go out into the world, well, when we open our eyes in the morning, the world comes at us and it comes at us with sights and sounds and smells and tastes and, you know, all of these things are, are out there. We're, we are getting this relentless 
and frenetically diverse flow of data, of information that's coming at us. And our brain's first core task is to make sense of that, to, to somehow say, okay, this, this stuff that's coming in, it, it, it must mean something. Uh, and so the brain wants to make sense out of this chaotic input. Let me just mention the chaotic input for a moment. Um, you know, when we see things in the world, we usually are just seeing bits and pieces. I'm looking out into my neighborhood as I talk to you, and there's a, it's a subdivision. So there's a bunch of cars parked here and in their driveways. And as I look at the cars in their driveway, the first car I see most of, or at least most of one side of, uh, but every other car is what I'd call partially occluded. There's something in front of it, be it a car before it or the bushes or something. So I'm only seeing bits and pieces of things. Um, in reality, in reality, that's what's coming to my eye. But my brain is seeing cars. Full, complete cars, even though that's not what's coming to my eye, that's what my brain ultimately perceives. And so this is what we're going to talk about is this magic of going from, you know, this crazy input of information to, to things in our mind that make sense. We'll define what making sense means in a moment. Okay, so if you could look at the human mind and if you could read its operating system, it would look something like this despise chaos, create order. Hence the name of this lecture. Um, yes, that's what we're going to be talking about in this chapter, the way the brain extracts order from chaos. And it's really cool. Um, so we'll have a few demos here to get you thinking about it and hopefully to get you impressed with it. Now, in, the, in this part, they're saying, hey, this is what the brain is all about. I don't I wouldn't argue this is what the brain is all about, but I would say it's what those three lobes are all about. The frontal lobe is a whole other story. Um, and so we'll get, to, we'll get to that when we talk about consciousness. We have a chapter on consciousness, which will be much more frontal-oriented. Um, uh, uh, this one is much more parietal, occipital, temporal. Okay, And this is what they do. Okay, so let me give you some examples. So we'll go, we'll go around the lobes a little bit and talk about this. So let's start with language, um, the temporal lobe, okay? And we're, what we're going to try to get at here is when I say the brain is trying to make sense of input or find order in the chaos, what does sense and order mean? And, and how does it do it? So we'll get, a, we'll get an answer to that, I think, as we go through this. Here's an example. I love to do this in class. I just ask somebody, read that thing on the, the bottom part as quickly as you can. And, you know, I haven't looked at it for a long time, but I can just look at it and say it doesn't matter in what order the letters of a word are. The sentence is still readable. Um, and most of you guys, you've seen these now on social media and stuff that people love to throw it around and go, wow, it's amazing, right? You can put this, this mess in front of the brain. Here's chaos, right? These are a bunch of stimuli. Well, other than a few, it, in, the, in, a, are, the, is, there's a few stimuli in there that the brain has seen before, but everything else is brand new. It's never seen it before. And yet, it can kind of figure out what that is. Well, not what it is, because what it is, for example, that second word, what it is, is diocent. <laughs> you know, that's what it is. But the brain doesn't get hooked, uh, hung up on the actual physical characteristics of the stimulus. It gets past those to what the meaning of the stimulus is. Where does it find meaning? It finds meaning, so I'm going to say this now out loud and I'll, and, I'll, and I'll emphasize it throughout. It finds meaning in its past experiences. Memory. When we talk about the brain making sense of something, it's connecting it with things it's experienced before. And so it hasn't experienced these two stimuli, but it has experienced stimuli quite similar to them. And in fact, in this context, so the brain starts getting the context and it would probably, ha probably have trouble with doesn't. It doesn't and it has to figure this out. But once it gets to here, you know, a very common word after it doesn't is matter. And so the brain is already starting to predict, oh, it doesn't matter. That makes sense. What do we mean makes sense? I've heard that term a lot. It's in my brain. It doesn't matter. And then we start, okay, it doesn't matter in... And, and the brain can start to use 
previous experience and, and to develop expectations about what's probably coming next. And it can use those to kind of figure out what's going. It doesn't matter in what order the letters of a word and the more information it starts to get, it's like a snowball, right? Where the, the previous stuff it's read is starting to give it really clear expectations about what's going to follow. And as long as what follows is roughly what it expects, that's good enough. Okay, so magic, magic, hey, eh? right? I mean, this is this is magic. The brain, we can throw this mess in front of it, and it can decode it immediately, um, and in fact, almost automatically to the point where we can't help but decode these things. It gets hard to see what's actually there because our brain wants to get right to perception. So let's talk about sensation and perception. Just let me, let me highlight this distinction a little to you and get you thinking about it. We're going to stress it in the chapter, but sensation refers to that raw input. So when we're, when we're eyes are looking at that and starting to bring that information in. Okay. And so that's what's actually in the world being perceived. But as it starts to be perceived very early on, we have this other process I've been talking about, the making sense process. Um, memory, previous experience, analyzing that input and kind of reforming it um, into what we will ultimately see in our minds. And what we ultimately see in our minds is what we're going to call perception. So when I read out loud, it doesn't matter in what order the letters of a word are, I'm telling you my perception. That's not, you know, if I tried to, if I tried to do my sensation, if I tried to get away from perception, I would have to do this. It doesn't matter in what order the letters in it. So, so this is more the sensation, right? Because I'm telling you what's really there. But what I'm telling you is that's hard. That's harder for me to do than to just say it doesn't matter in what order the letters of a word are. That The brain goes right to perception, okay? It brings us right there in a very fluid and natural way. Let's do some other examples to kind of um, hit this. Um, I will often put this up in front of people. I'll say, please read that. And then I will um, have it go away. And I will give just a, a simple question. How many words were in that thing that you just saw? So what do you think? How many words were in it? Um, let, me, let me remember. Right. Okay, so in reality, there was that many. Cool. So what do you say? So, so let me throw two, let, let me say five, six, seven, eight. Which one do you think? My suspicion is that most of you say six right? The reality is seven. Do you think six? Do you think seven? If you think six, I'm going to throw it back up there again for you and just take a little bit of time to look at it and, and see what you think. Okay, here it is. Now actually count the words. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Oh, there's seven. Why did you, why did so many people think six? Again, I will normally throw this up in front of class and ask someone to read this. And when they read it, they say, I love Paris in the springtime. Right. And if you actually count, I love Paris in the springtime. That's six. Okay. What's here? I love Paris in the, the springtime. There's two thes. That's why it's seven. But the point here is the brain just removes one of them. Okay, doesn't make sense. Doesn't make sense. The, the. I've never seen the, the. Well, okay, there's a band called the, the, and they're a very good band. <laughs> I quite like them, actually. Oh, but in most cases in the world, we don't see the, the written right side by side. And so the brain just removes one of them because then this phrase fits with something it knows that it's seen before. I love Paris in the springtime. It makes sense. Where making sense means connecting it with previous experience. Okay, so these are the examples from language. So this is sort of the temporal lobe um, showing you this phenomenon of, of going to perception, you know, and, and kind of, yeah, having that dominate. Let's go to a different modality. Let's go to perception. So this would be more uh, visual perception is what I'm going to do here. So this would be much more um, auditory cortex. And so when we do auditory cortex, so I, I throw this one up here. I sometimes talk to judges for whatever reason. And, and so I like to say, who is this? Um, and I don't know, many of you guys may simply not know. So for many of you guys, when you look at this thing on the left, you might be like, yeah, I don't know what that is. But for some of you, at least if you had, you know, 
people in your household who like watching these weird um, TV judge shows, this is Judge Judy. Um, and you can find her online. If you go look up Judge Judy, you'll see her. And she's got a TV show that often shows her basically in this position, sitting at her bench, um, talking to, to people um, in some sort of lawsuit kind of situation. Um, now, what I've done is I've taken that Judge Judy image and I've just overlaid a bunch of mess on top of it. Chaos, for lack of a better word. But if you've seen Judge Judy before, if you know that show, once again, your brain can pull the order. What do we mean by order? It's stuff I've seen before, stuff I recognize, recognize, right? Um, and, and the fact that I've perceived her before, that I've, that I've had her image in my mind before, now I can pull that out and it makes sense. I can recognize that that is Judge Judy with a bunch of mess all over top of it. But that mess kind of d disappears. It doesn't disappear. It's still there. But at the level of my perception, I'm able to perceive Judge Judy. I'm able to perceive an American flag here behind her, a bench in front of her, um, probably a gavel on her hand here, but I can't really perceive that very well. Uh, but the rest of this, I can perceive, you know, her white shirt over her black um, judge's robe, uh, etc. So once again, pulling order from chaos. Now our visual system does this all the time, right? One of the things I, I joke about when I'm teaching in front of the lecture is I like to walk behind the podium as I lecture. And when I walk behind the podium, I, I, I'm like, why are you guys not shocked? You know, as I go behind the podium, my legs disappear. They're gone. I have no legs. All I am is a torso, you know, and, and so I'll, I'll intentionally stand behind the podium so that no one can see my legs. It's like, I'm just a torso up here talking to you that should freak you out um that should seem weird but it doesn't our brain says yeah i can't see his legs but his legs are there they didn't disappear yes they disappeared in the world you know they were there and then he went behind the podium and they weren't there but the brain knows that in reality you know human legs do not appear and disappear all of a sudden and and so it's able to deal with the fact that it can no longer see my legs but it doesn't suddenly go whoa his legs are gone um it's just able to make sense of the fact that there's things in front of me just like this okay here's another example and, and i'm using these examples just to show you the extent the brain will go to make sense of things. Um, so this is an example from something we're gonna call Gestalt psychology, and we'll revisit some of this. But just for now, when I ask people to describe what they see there, what do you see? There's always some people that, that do the sensation thing. I'll get there in a second, because they, they've gotten smart you know, by now. They're like, hang on, Jordan's is up to something. Um, but if I say, no, no, just don't, don't get worried. Just tell me what you naturally see when you look at that. Most people will say, okay, I see three circles and two triangles. And, and the triangles are stacked on top of each other and on top of the circles so that there's this white triangle on top uh, with this black outlined triangle underneath and the white triangle is also occluding the circles okay so that's what you see is, is an object up top here now the interesting thing is this upper triangle does not exist there, there is nothing like if we zoomed right in here or zoomed right in here or anywhere where it feels like there's lines where you feel like you see a line there is no line when you zoom in there, what there really is here is three greater than or less than signs, sort of, and three Pac-Men. That's really what's out there. And that's what the sensation people will say after they've gotten you. Say, oh, I know. I know what you're up to. Yes, that's in reality what's out in the world. But what we perceive, what our mind perceives, is this upper triangle occluding those other ones. And it's even able to sort, you know, it, it sees something that isn't there. Uh, why is it doing this? Again, because it makes more sense to the brain. It sees triangles and circles in the world all the time. And sometimes they're occluding each other. They're, they're sitting on top of each other. And so it sees bits and pieces of triangles and circles all the time. Um, it doesn't see a lot of Pac-Men in the world. It doesn't see a lot of greater than or less than signs. And so the thing that makes most sense to the brain from what it knows when it looks at this is two triangles and three circles arranged in a certain way. Uh, and again, that's where, where it'll go to, okay? So you're, get, you're getting the story here. 
yeah, how many objects. So, and, and let's just do an example from life to, just to take it at this higher level still. If you're a, a fan of any sport, um, and especially, you know, imagine a sport like basketball where there's continuous fouls, right? So this guy's going up for a shot. This is like a raptor, yay, go raptors. But this evil Washington guy over here is clearly pushing him and, and you know, not, not, that's not allowed. <laughs> okay. Well, at any rate, if you and somebody, so let's say Raptors fans and Washington fans were watching the game, there would be times when there would be potential fouls like this. And invariably, the Toronto fans will think that the Washington team is committing a bunch of fouls that they're getting away with, whereas the Raptors team is getting called for fouls that they didn't even do. And the Washington fans will think the reverse. They're watching the exact same game, but they're seeing it very differently. They're seeing it in a way that makes sense to them. And what makes sense to them is that their team is the good team team <laughs> all right we all think our team is the good team and so our team doesn't commit fouls but wow do other teams commit fouls against us and the ref the ref is always against us right <laughs> and no matter which team you vote for you think the ref is hard on your team uh, because you think your team is good so once again that's what makes sense to us is that our team is not fouling much and the other team is because they're the bad team um, and we literally see the game differently um, if it's us and somebody rooting for that other team uh, and you'll have arguments you know among the two teams about whether something was a foul or not because the players by the way see it differently so this isn't just the fans you know it's it's everybody who experiences that event um, so that's just an example for life why do i have trump here oh my goodness <laughs> these lectures are free. It just he almost gives me, it puts my fight or flee in, in action. Like, uh, okay, well, I guess what, what, I'm, what I'm seeing here is how this has almost been weaponized, um, you know, in the Trump era where th things that should not be controversial at all, you know, data, fact, reality, um, when you have somebody who sees it differently because of their political perspective or whatnot, we can have now people from the, on the right and the left it's experiencing the same events, but drawing completely different conclusions about what they mean. Um, and, and that's, you know, this is how scary it can be, this tendency to see things that make sense for us. But if you're a right-wing person, the sensical is very different than if you're a left-wing person. And therefore, you end up living in different realities. And, and I think we see that uh, in the modern world. So this is you know, a natural reaction to sort of what the brain does. Okay, cool. So I just wanted to start there with that big picture. Um, and, and let's just sort of um, grab it here that the brain is really good at dealing with uncertainty. It has to be. Because it's in this chaotic world with just flow of, you know, of relentless, uh, what was the other word? Chaotic input. Uh, and so that's the world it's in. And what it's gotten really good at is making sense of that input. And, and it will just go to great lengths. It will assume information or ignore information in ways that allow it to make sense. Um, and it relies heavily in the past. So it'll even go, you know, if we consider some of the examples there, the words in the wrong order, well, it reorders the letters of the words to make them make sense. In the I Love Paris, Paris in the Springtime, it removed a word to make it make sense. In the Judge Judy example, it somehow pulled the information out of all of that mess to make it make sense. Um, you know, and so we're seeing the extent that the brain will go to in that uh, Gestalt one with the triangle. It's actually making you see something that isn't even there because then it makes sense. Okay, so the brain will take this input and it will process it. It will change it in ways that make it make sense. And when we say it makes sense, we largely mean that it fits with previous experiences. It's, it's, it's kind of assuming that as I've learned about the world, there'll be a certain consistency to it. And the things I'm seeing now or hearing now will probably relate to things I've seen or heard in the past. And that's the best way to make sense of them is to reconnect them with that past. Uh, and so it literally changes the input to match things that it's seen before or tries to. 
and when it can, it makes sense. By the way, when we can't do that, then we're left with this feeling that things don't make sense. And that's really, really frustrating for the brain. Now, I'll, I'll give you one example of this. The, the shooter from Las Vegas a long time ago it was a country music thing. And somebody went to a hotel room with a bunch of guns and started shooting at all these country music fans from a hotel room. Everybody wanted to know why. Was this a terrorist thing? Was, it, was there some sort of um, racial you know, angle to it. Like what made this person do it? And nobody could ever give you a story. The brain wants things to make sense. It wants to see that shooting and, and connect it with previous ones and say, oh, right. That person did it because they thought we, we were all evil. That person did it because they were schizophrenic and, and they had whatever sort of, um, delusion sort of guiding them. Um, we want to say, okay, this is like that. And when we have something that's not like anything we've experienced before, we're kind of like, ugh. It doesn't feel good. We want things to make sense. The brain is compelled to try to make sense of the input it receives. And it's darn good at it. Um, it does cool things, um, as we've talked about in this lecture. Okay, so cool. Hopefully you're impressed with your brain. Um, you'll think about that a little bit as you walk around the world and, and you're experiencing all this input and trying to make sense of it. And we will go on and we'll talk about some of the sensation and perception processes in a lot more detail as we go through the chapter.